we had a conversation yesterday about how the pandemic has just really warped people's sense of time and that everything's immediate. Every meeting is instantaneous. All you need to do is click a link. There's no breaks. People don't eat or use the bathroom. They just, they don't build in breaks anymore because all you gotta do is click. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we're discussing how individuals, leaders, and institutions can work to better create work environments and lives for student affairs professionals with the editor and two authors of the new book, Creating Sustainable Careers in Student Affairs. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for those of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com or on Twitter. Today, we have two sponsors. First of all is Leadership. Leadership is the not-for-profit not organization that has been partnering with colleges, universities, and organizations in creating transformational leadership experiences since 1986. With a focus on creating a more just, caring, and thriving world, Leadership provides both virtual and in-person leadership development opportunities for students and professionals. When you partner with Leadership, you will receive quality developmental experiences that engage learners in topics of courageous dialogue, integrity, equity, resilience, and community building. To find out more about their programs, please visit leadershape.org slash virtual programs. You can also connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Today's episode is also brought to you by Stylus Publishing, which published the book we're focused on today. Stylus is proud to be a sponsor of Student Affairs Now podcast. Browse their student affairs, diversity, and professional development titles at styluspub.com. Use promo code SANOW for 30% off all books plus free shipping. You can find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. You can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I'm hosting today's conversation from Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is the ancestral homeland of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. Today, we're unpacking context, perspectives, and recommendations for changing the culture of work in student affairs. We've got fabulous guests today. Let's meet them. Please share with us uh, your name, your role, your pronouns, and how you've contributed to this project. Um, let's start off with Rosie. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Rosie Perez. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an associate professor of higher education at the University of Michigan. Today, I join you from Ann Arbor, which occupies the lands of the Ashinaabe, or people of the three fires namely the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Badawami nations. Uh, one area of my research focuses on the professional socialization of graduate students, including folks in student affairs. And I'm really interested in the implications that socialization has, not just on experiences in graduate school, but what happens to you after graduate school. So with that said, I wrote a chapter on student affairs graduation, graduate preparation programs and how they can work to uphold or contest ideal worker norms as we prepare people to work in the field. Um, I'll also say that as a faculty member, I'm in a higher ed program, like I literally am doing this every day, right? So I am very mindful about the messages that I send to students and how I might model or um, push against ideal worker norms every day. Oh, so exciting. There's that word, ideal worker norms. We're going to unpack that here in a little bit. So glad you're with us, Rosie. Ben, tell us a little bit about you. Thanks, Keith. My name is Ben Stubbs, he, him. I serve as the director of student engagement at the University of West Florida, where I'm also an adjunct, adjunct instructor for the College Student Affairs Administration Master's Program. Uh, as a campus life professional, I've had the opportunity to work in campus recreation with fraternity story life, student activities, leadership and service, a variety of other programs. And so I was uh, happy to work with and speak with my colleagues in those uh, areas to provide a chapter to the book related to their experiences and uh, how they uh, navigate and uh, try to work through uh, the expectations uh, related to their work. Awesome. We're glad you're here, Ben. And Margaret, you're the editor that put all of this together, framed it, brought in uh, the two authors we have and many other folks. Tell us a little bit more about you. Thanks, Keith. So my name is Margaret Salee. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an associate professor and the program coordinator for the higher education program at the University at Buffalo. And UB is located 
on the lands of the um, Seneca Nation, which is a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. And my work um, typically focuses on work family issues and work life issues, which is why this book is so near and dear to my heart. But I look at the ways that faculty, staff, and students navigate work and life issues and the implications this has for folks of different identities. So as you mentioned, I, I, br I brought the cast of characters together for this book mm -hmm. um, and conceptualized it with a lot of help from all of the authors who brought the book in ways in directions that I actually hadn't originally conceptualized. Yeah, I love it when a project emerges into something different along the way. Uh, let's start with you, Margaret. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the challenges facing student affairs workers and the profession today? Kind of give us a summary of where we're at. I, I know people talk about this a lot and people cite a lot of numbers and it seems to really shift and vary, but you've been really thinking about this. Tell us what, what really is going on. Well, I mean, sort of what Rosie was talking about, we, we do this work on a daily basis, right? And our faculty members as we're talking to students and you know, for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've seen my students coming into my office and just being exhausted. And I've been talking with folks who are new in the profession and mid-level in the profession and senior in the profession, and folks are exhausted. Um, and so I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges. I think first off, right, we see a lot of attrition in the field. Um, you know, earlier studies said that 50% of folks leave the field in their first five years. Um, and that, that's, that is problematic. You know, partially we could talk about whether or not there are some growing pains that happens as folks enter the field in their mid twenties and figure out that, that there might be other directions for them. But I think that there are conditions in the field that are creating problems. So, you know, as we talked about folks feeling overwhelmed, working long hours, um, you know, especially the demands of working in residence life can be all consuming. As Ben can talk about, Right, as he learned in his chapter, and probably from working in past <laughs> in the past, working in student activities can be very exhausting. So folks are really just working 24/7. They are feeling like they need to be the ideal worker, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, a little bit later. Um, and that just that leads to burnout. So they're no longer invested in the in the work. They're experiencing also secondary trauma since our students are coming in with so many issues now. There's also the okay of the field. We all love the work, um, but sometimes people look outside the, to industry to see what they could do, um, perhaps that might compensate them better. So there's the whole host of issues. I mean, that's just that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? But yeah. I think those are some of the issues that I've seen. Right. You're, you're talking about people leaving the field for different reasons. It reminds me of um, college students who leave an institution, right? Some of them leave for because it's not the right place for them, that it they're better not being in it. That is a, is a good choice for them to leave. And then others, it is a miss. We have not served them. They, they you know, and, and you're sort of thinking about the profession that way. For some people, they learn, they grow, they figure out something else is, is a better for them. Um, and then others have uh, been mismanaged, have poor leadership, have had unrealistic expectations. And you're pointing to the the exhaustion and trauma and just two of our most popular, most viewed, most listened to episodes have been two episodes on trauma and burnout and compassion fatigue. So both the trauma we're experiencing and then as you mentioned, the secondary trauma with students. I think also, something else I, I might add to that Keith is in addition to leaving the field, those are the same reasons people leave their positions to go to positions at other institutions. And while certainly it's great for folks to pursue whatever new opportunities they would like if, if they think that's best for them and their families, in my experience, a lot of times when people leave, it's because uh, they are feeling these things in their current position. They still want to stay in student affairs, and a lot of times they do stay in student affairs, but they transition to another university, which creates a vacancy, which creates overload on the other people uh, in the office. And it's, it's really disruptive to the work environment and to the experience of the rest of the team. And so there are those impacts in addition to just leaving the field. There are those impacts even when folks leave positions and stay in the field. Right. Or move to other functional areas that they think won't be as 24 seven. Exactly. But then I'm also reminded of a couple of uh, senior student affairs folks who felt like the position was too much at this institution, the expectations were unrealistic, and they, they moved to another institution and now it's 24 seven. <laughs> I remind them, the only commonality is you. So maybe, <laughs> how do you think through some of this? And, uh, but we do get caught in these patterns, particularly as senior folks who have been under this ideal worker norm and these expectations. And this is what a real student affairs professional is. When you've been doing that for 30 years, it's hard to shift those patterns. 
Margaret, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this ideal worker, this concept, where does it come from and how does it really help us understand and challenge some of what's going on? Yeah, thank you. So um, 30 years ago, trying to do the math, um, Joan Acker and Joan Williams sort of at the same time came up with this concept of the ideal worker. And basically the ideal worker refers to, it's not a good thing. So let's just start there, even though ideal is, is in the title, right? It, it basically refers to the employee who is always working and always available to the organization. So, and the, the flip side, the concurrent piece is that the person has a wife and I use this language very intentionally, right? right. Because very much it's a heteronormative, heterosexist construct who's available at home to take care of any family responsibilities. So this means that an employee could work nights, could work weekends, could just drop, pick things up at the drop of the hat and go on a trip. Um, and obviously the, this is what organizations depend on um, in, or to be successful. So the, the, right, there are so many consequences here that folks feel like they have to work all the time to advance. You know, I was just in a meeting where folks were being praised for working all the time. Um, and we, we still, even though that we challenge this as a, as a construct, at least in this space, we're challenging it. Mm -hmm. It's this real recognition that if you want to get ahead, you got to put your time in and you gotta got to be responsive. I would also say with student affairs in particular, that's framed as you need to be always available for your students. So, right, if a student has an issue at 11 p.m., you need to be responsive. You it, like put yourself after the needs of your students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I hear this uh, just on its face, irrational, right? <laughs> if you're always available all the time, like that doesn't make any sense, but I, right. I hear it justified with, well, your salary, not hourly. So that's mm -hmm. what that means. I hear it justified with, um, aren't you committed to your students? Mm -hmm. um, and I hear it justified with, I did it when I was an RD, right? <laughs> Which mm -hmm. is the same thing that justifies hazing, right? That's the same rationale that, that goes into some of that. Um, so thanks for, thanks for setting this up and framing sort of the challenge of people leaving the field, the exhaustion, the burnout, the trauma, but then also this notion of ideal worker and, and we're gonna trouble this. Um, before we, we get in here from here, from Ben and from Rosie, um, you edited the book, you wrote several of the chapters, you framed it, you organized it. You also invited lots of different people in. Could you kind of give us an overview of the book, which people can get from Stylus with our discount code at 30% off. It's available now, so go ahead. But kind of give us a walkthrough of the book overall. Yeah, thank you. So the, the book is divided into three different parts, right? And the first part really is an introduction to ideal worker norms um, and how it affects the work of the profession. So it, Ben has a chapter in there where he is looking at the impact on folks in particular functional areas. We all, as you brought up, folks in residence life in particular are, are dealing with these ideal worker norms on a daily basis. One chapter just dedicated to residence life professionals. There's a different chapter that looks at differences by institutional type because what it means to be the ideal worker at a research university in student affairs is different than in community colleges than is different at a small liberal arts colleges. I'm sure your listeners are probably thinking to themselves, yeah, that's true, right? Mm -hmm. Rosie has this tremendous chapter in the first part about socialization to graduate school and sort of socialization of graduate students. So that's the, that's the first part of the text. The middle part is when I talk about what folks brought to the project that I couldn't have envisioned. I mean, I envisioned it because I invited them, but it's really about the, the mental health impact, right? So um, where you talked about one of, your, one of your most popular podcasts being about compassion fatigue and burnout, that it, that's, we have a couple of chapters dedicated exactly to that, thinking through um, how affairs professionals experience that, but also how parapros, um, RAs in this case, might experience um, burnout and compassion fatigue. And one of my favorite chapters in the book, although they're all my favorites, of course, um, is one chapter that is co-authored by Pamela Gralia, Carla Perez-Velez, and D.L. Stewart on sort of this notion of uh, self-care, right? And how we see that around all the time, that we need to think self-care, which is not what we need to do, and that we need to be, think about S-care, and how neoliberalism has really pushed student affairs into this direction of abandoning the individual, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
or focusing on the individual, which really abandons the individual. So that's the second part of the book. And I think I emphasize that a lot because I think it's not often a conversation that folks thinking about the work in student affairs think about. The final section of the book, the final third, looks at differences by identity groups. So what does it look like to be an ideal worker and how are you impacted by ideal worker norms if you're somebody of color, if you're LGBTQ, if you are from the working class or poor? Um, we have a chapter on new professionals and graduate students, and then we have a couple of different chapters on parents, one for mothers and one for fathers. So that's the probably a little longer overview than he wanted, but that's basically the three parts of the yeah. text um, and what they all do together to really examine this on a multi-level basis. Right. Well, you mentioned in the book that, that most of this was written pre-COVID, uh, but then you were kind of concluding and, and, you know, polishing things up and got to mention it as you were sending it off. But this notion of a lot of what you're describing, we're feeling so poignantly. I mean, I'm hearing from people about RAs unionizing and refusing to show up for shifts because they don't feel safe, they don't think it's fair. RDs leaving the position because it's just too overwhelming, they can't do it anymore. Um, a lot of uh, mid-level and senior level folks who are just completely burnt out and fried and have been for months. Um, so these things were patterns before COVID, but I think COVID is really making it just so, so visible. Um, but the difference is many of us are not seeing each other in the hallway, right? We're not seeing each other slouched over, dragging. We're seeing each other on Zoom meetings. Um, uh, Margaret shared a lot about the challenges and attrition. Um, but and, and as, as we've already done, we often think about uh, live on staff, folks who are on call and on duty, who live in residence halls, housing professionals, and they certainly are facing a lot of what we're talking about, but we also wanna expand beyond that. So Ben, maybe you can help us think beyond the, the housing folks um, and the challenges that you see playing out. You wrote about Greek life, student activities, campus recreation. How are these showing up similarly or different for some of these folks? Sure, thanks Keith. I think it's really important you just mentioned, there's essentially two stories here. There's the experience of campus life professionals, those in the positions you just mentioned, uh, pre-pandemic and potentially post-pandemic, and then there's their experiences sort of in the last year during the pandemic, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to address both. When speaking with campus life professionals in those areas, you're going to hear about nights and weekends, you're going to hear about long and irregular hours, and for most of us, that's actually written into our job descriptions, right, and we kind of accept that as part of the work because that's when students can play, that's when they can meet, that's when they can attend leadership workshops and community service events, and so it's, it's reasonable that our work includes uh, those hours and those times. What our colleagues in other functional areas may not be as aware of is the amount of crisis response work that Greek life and recreation staff members in particular uh, engage with. Some Greek life units, Margaret, you mentioned in reviewing the chapter, this, this was news to you, that some Greek life units have on-call rotations uh, like housing or Dina students offices do. And those that don't have a rotation, that just means everyone's on call all the time, I think. Uh, <laughs> recreation staff members have to deal with injuries. They have to deal with outdoor adventure trips that are all over the country doing various things. They have to deal with student-led sport club travel. I used to oversee a sport club program and every weekend there'd be 10 groups of student-led trips driving 12 passenger vans through weather and mountains and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that creates a lot of extra work. The major issue is not necessarily that that, that occurs, but when I talk to folks, the, the problem seemed to be that they were expected to do that work in addition to their standard nine to five hours and to their standard uh, functions. It's almost like that work has emerged in, in recent years in ways that it didn't used to exist and it was just sort of added on. It's never really been built into the schedule. The other thing that really stood out to me in my conversations and that aligned with my own personal experiences was the ways that campus life professionals are both valued for and also, also marginalized by their reputation for being competent, all-purpose team members who are accustomed to manual labor, to be honest, <laughs> and who have an ear to the ground and good relationships with students. Uh, also partly due to outdated ideas about our work, many campus colleagues see us as fun and energetic. And so if you want mm -hmm. your event to be fun and energetic, you need some student, student life folks there. Mm -hmm. None of these things are bad, right? These sound like compliments and, and positive traits, but they create a lot of tension for campus life professionals. Because of this reputation, right? The same people 
end up serving on special event committees. They end up, uh, you know, involved with and asked to help contribute to efforts to respond to campus crises. Uh, they're expected to set up and break down complex events and asked to help out with last minute projects more often than team members in other roles, right? One of my participants said, you know, they're not gonna ask somebody in the health center, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're, I'm generalizing a bit here, right? I've, I've cleaned up after events alongside faculty members and budget managers and counselors and every other position, but the expectations and the pressure I think is often different for student life folks. And this extra work, right? These extra committees, uh, event support, crisis response is very disruptive to the core work and to the things that you're being evaluated on and expected to produce nonetheless. And the result is that professionals are foregoing personal and family commitments. They're spending less time on activities that support well being. Mm -hmm. You know, we also talked about the effects of the pandemic. And in my experience, uh, the late nights and the weekends and the special event support for some people, it's really just been replaced with other similar extra work. Uh, in the past years, we've taken on new roles, whether it's distributing face coverings, right, for the entire campus community, mm -hmm. planning four different versions of the same event <laughs> based on whether it's going to be allowed or not. Uh, and I really want to make sure I mention advising students during the social unrest and political uh, climate that we've had over the last several years. Uh, that's a lot of challenging and emotionally draining work that campus life professionals are often doing that, that they have to do, again, in addition to still planning the event and, and getting recruitment done uh, and, and getting intramural events done with, safely and correctly. So mm -hmm. it's really challenging. And, and most campus life staff members basically feel that they just have to make it work and adapt to any and all expectations that both the institution and that you mentioned earlier that the students uh, throw at them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm getting, I'm feeling overwhelmed, Ben. Uh, <laughs> I feel like what you're describing is this game of Jenga, right? Where we just put pieces on top and put pieces on top and put pieces on top. One of the things I often say is the student affairs professionals are great and the profession is great at being entrepreneurial, coming up with new ideas. Terrible being editorial, like what are we gonna take <laughs> away? And if you are expected to have uh, office hours or, or be on campus while the campus is open from say 8.30 to 4.30, but then you got to come in for the 7.30 meeting because we're all booked from 8.30 to 4.30. So you got to come in for the 7.30 meeting uh, for the search committee because it's really important. And you got to come in at lunch and meet over lunch because our schedule is a book. We don't have any other time. And then your staff meeting is at nine o'clock because that's when the students are available. And then the 2 a.m. call and all of this. Um, I love your sentence about we added these things on. We didn't build them in, right? And, and some of what we're talking about that happened in the off hours is life or death, really critical work, but how do we build it in? And I think that's one of the opportunities of all the shifts we're seeing around COVID, right. uh, working virtually, engaging students virtually, so many things were shifting. And, and I really hope that we're able to think about things in a different way, which brings us to you, Rosie. <laughs> um, we, all, we all learned this. I mean, I learned this ideal worker thing in graduate school. I learned it as a master's student that you know, if, if you're dedicated, you'll work 60 hours a week as a grad student plus classes. And um, that's how you'll get a good job when you leave here and be employed. And if you don't do that, then maybe this isn't right for you. Um, how, how is the, the socialization that happens um, in, in grad school contributing to this and how can it help address some of it? Right, so, you know, I know not everybody goes to grad school first, but increasingly in our field, people are moving straight to graduate school from their undergraduate, not like when I went to grad school 20 years ago, plus and like most people had worked and I hadn't, that mm -hmm. pathway is a little bit different, right? So um, that's an important thing to acknowledge. That, you know, the reality is grad school is designed to teach people like the norms of your field. What are the good practices? How do we do this in our field, broadly speaking? And, you know, the reality is in many programs, both intentionally and unintentionally, we send messages um, that it, you have to overwork yourself, right? Even, and, and contradictory, we're like, don't do all the things, but we reward students with the rewards, opportunities, if they're willing to do more. So it's really confusing, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, like people just get the message, if I wanna get a job, I'm, I'm gonna do more. And I've realized increasingly in prep programs, Students get so, they flame out in two years or a year and a half. 
and they're going into full-time work tired. Like we've fatigued them before they begin full-time practice because some of them are working from a place of fear. If I don't do all of the things now, I won't get a job. I'm looking at what my peers are doing. They're all doing too much. They can't editorialize, Keith, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you, you said. Um, but we've kind of built this system where everything is more um, and it's, it's like completely unsustainable, like the title of the book, right? But we've learned it really early. Um, and I, I, I really worry about this, like all the time that we are preparing people before they've even engaged in full-time practice for many folks, they're coming tired. So what is the likelihood they're going to stay if they're burnt in, in two years, right? Which um, I know part of this is related to the discussions we have or don't have, honestly, about professionalism and how it's coded. So a lot of my chapter gets into the idea about professionalism and its relation to the ideal worker. Professionalism often coded in ways that mean overworking, um, giving all that you can at the cost of yourself, but professionalism also coded in ways that center people who are white, male, middle-class, heterosexual, you know, don't have children. And so this idea of learning to be a good professional in grad school has cost individuals, but it also upholds <laughs> look, just all the systems of oppression we say we wanna burn down. <laughs> right, well, and you're reminding me because I think what we do for people who don't fit that model is they have to do the, all those things plus all the other jobs, which is very similar, right? Yes. And then we also use this thing that I, it can be helpful for folks, but also really harmful, right? The field is so small, right? Mm. We use it as a way to, to, right. to get people to network, right? The field is small. You'll meet lots of people. The field is small. Don't screw up, comply, do more. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's these, these things we tell people about the field um, really, again, like emphasize sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally ideal worker norms and that, that compliance, that focus on being a good professional when left unexamined from a critical lens, right, moves us really far away from what we say we want. We want holistic development. We want people to stay in the field for a long time. We want to, you know, advanced social justice and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the work of graduate prep programs, right? Like a lot of it for me is stop, talk stop talking in coded language. You yeah. know, like we have to make what's tacit more explicit and, and just talk about it because it, it gives people an opportunity to at least articulate where they're struggling, what they don't understand, the tensions that they're feeling. Because what I've realized is lots of folks feel this tension of the ideal worker, don't have language for it. And because no one else is talking about it, they think they're not doing it right. If they're yeah. supposed to be doing 60 hours of work at 40, yeah. like they just haven't figured something out. I'm like, no, it's designed to do that, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, I really have thought a lot about how do we just talk more and then think about if we don't want it to be this way, what would we actually do? when we move into positions where we have power and authority, right? And so I, I incorporate the, this, these discussions really explicitly in my courses. And I think students are always like, oh, what is professionalism? And nobody can come up with one definition. And the fact that we can't, right? But we all talk about it is a big thing. Yeah. Talk about how that well, you're us. You're reminding me of tenure, right? The whole idea of tenure, the the the, the unspoken ver. Oh, our faculty members just got twitchy. All right, all right, it's okay, it's okay. But the whole idea of tenure, non-explicit idea of tenure, is if we make you do this for five years, then once we give you tenure, you'll keep doing it anyway, right? right. And we see so much of this. And Rosie, you're mentioning student affairs pros who get socialized into this 40, 60 hours a week when their assistantship is 15 or 20 hours then when I get a job that's supposed to be 40, well, then 60 to 80, and some of them get burnt out and leave. Some mm -hmm. of them get burnt out and stay. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And sometimes and when they're that done? burnt out, they're not good anymore. They're not, they don't want to be in the work. It's no, their job, but they don't really want to do this. It's well, too hard. and how many of us are, because we're burnt out, are not good at our jobs and not fun, not good to be around right? We become mm -hmm. troubling. We become toxic. We, we take out our hurts on our colleagues and our students or our supervisees. Um, I'm just really reminded of when I was in grad school, 
um, feeling like my 20 hour assistantship should be 40, 60 hours a week. That's just the reality. I was thinking like, this is what doctors do in medical school, right? They just sell out. This is just the deal. That was my mentality. And I went to a, a regional conference where three leaders of student unions at the epic of their career sat there and talked about how the job had overwhelmed them. And one had multiple suicide attempts because of their burnout and trauma. One had lost a marriage because his wife felt like he loved his union more than he loved his partner. Mm -hmm. um, and another one had just troubling relationship with the, his children. And I walked out of that going, no, I'm not treating this like medical school. I'm not selling out. And that probably lasted like three days. <laughs> and then I got back into it, right? <laughs> and then I would start my new job and I would make a recommitment and that would last maybe a week. And then, but that's what socialization is. It never stops, right? It's constantly coming in. Right. So I think as a faculty person, right? When I have students constantly telling me they're tired and that they're overworking, right? I always think instead of saying, well, what could you do to set boundaries? Which is part of it. In my head, I'm like, well, what conversation do we need to have with assistantship providers? about what's reasonable, like how do we, how are we supporting students? Like that is one of the things that I find really difficult, right? Faculty do their thing and, and uh, assistantship, practicum providers, you do yours. In some programs they are more tightly coupled, but sometimes we don't really talk enough about the loads we're putting on students. And we could work in better partnership to talk about how we could better do this and not amplify ideal worker norms. You know, I also think as faculty and people who supervise grad students, it would probably be helpful if we would more uh, be more public or own where we're struggling with this, right? Like, I think my students have responded, they find it fascinating that I have like, a daughter, right? And they love when real life interrupts, even though sometimes I'm mortified, right? Like, oh no. Um, but for them, that's like a very humanizing thing. It's not like when you get your master's or PhD or get a particular job, you're going to get it better. Mm -hmm. But this, our field is designed to we built a field in a way that sustains this struggle. And we're not in it alone, but we've designed it so we don't always talk about it yeah. until it's like to the point we're breaking, right? Mm -hmm. So I would just argue that like, as we look ahead, what would it take for us to really be more open and transparent so that we can think about actually changing things rather than just saying it's so hard. Well, um, open with the struggles we're facing, right? How hard yeah. it is, how we're tired, but also open with our strategies. Like I got to mm -hmm. exercise and I do these things and I've had this conversation and I passed on this opportunity. Um, Margaret, we started with you. Let's circle back to you. What are uh, hearing from Ben and from Rosie? What, what sort of, what's important things that you want to make sure don't get missed in this conversation? There's so many things. I mean, I think <laughs> Rosie's point, right, about the individual strategies are important, but it it's the organizational change, it's systemic change that we need. I mean, it clearly, it while we're all waiting for that change or while we're waiting to be a part of that change and participate in that change, there are things that I think f folks can and should do. And it has varying levels of impact, right? Depending on your, your uh, location in the organization, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've been having lots of conversations with folks about uh, the e like delayed send on your email. <laughs> so, you know, and that and it's really interesting to me, it seems like a no brainer in terms of if I have something I want to get off my desk, I will, and because of my work hours, right? I'm a single mom by choice of three year old twins. And so my work days are shifted in <laughs> weird ways. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. They were two year olds during the lockdown. So, <laughs> um, but so, right, my work hours are shifted in ways that other people's aren't. But um, so I will do a lot of work at night, but I don't want to send Ben an email at 10 p.m. at night and have him it stress him out, right? He works in, in student activities, so maybe he's used to that. But so I will use the delayed send feature so somebody gets it the next morning. And to me, this is just a simple thing. It, and there, it's layered, right? It's still, I'm still working, but other folks aren't feeling compelled to respond. So in any case, individual strategies to sort of manage our own work, I think, as you said, building in time for exercise, and but it's really a, a systemic issue that I think needs to be addressed at the top. National associations, and I'm seeing movement, right? NASPA is really interested in taking this up right now. 
um, and a Kauai is really interested too and in sort of considering what the role of the live on professional. It's like on cue, those twins just decided, hey, we heard you talking about us and here they're chiming in from the background. Well, well, they did, they just came back from a walk, so. Yeah, just to what perfect scripting and timing. I, I love it. That's our um, family for you. Yeah. Uh, ben, what do, what do you think that um, folks who wanna make some of these shifts, I think the conversation often is about what the individual can do, but how do we talk about, I'm your supervisor, what is it that you're doing? What is it that I can do? How can I advocate for you? How can we work on this together? How can we shift these? How can we work to change the, the structures? I think we, we get easy talking about systems and structures as though they're elsewhere, but you know, they're, the administration is us. Uh, so how can we shift some of these? How can we make some different changes? Um, what would you suggest, Ben? Yeah, that, as Rosie mentioned, this is sort of built into our field and, and so many, tiny ways. The good news is I, I think that there are very few supervisors and senior officials who actively seek out to leverage ideal worker norms to squeeze every drop of work they can out of their employees with, with no concern for the, for the well-being or the, the, whether or not the work is gratifying for them. And I, I think it's really important, as we've talked about, to point it out, to address the issue, to talk about it so that we can work on it. And just like any challenging thing, it's not going to be easy, but as long as we're striving towards improvement, there's really, mm -hmm. there, there's some low hanging fruit and then there's some, some more challenging things. Uh, for instance, in, in our work, most, most campus life folks just take it as a, they resign themselves to this norm that we will attend and advise students during meetings whenever they decide to set them. That if the students can only meet at nine, well, the meeting's at nine. Uh, and I think in many cases, there's real opportunity, especially if supported by a department head or, or an AVP or up, there's really opportunity to figure out how to balance meeting the needs of the students in terms of their schedules, but also recognizing that the professional staff member has obligations as well. And it's going to be better at their job and more gratified by their job if we can not have them attending 10 p.m. meetings, in addition to special events or weekend programs and things of that nature. And the and, 7 a.m. breakfast meeting for the search committee. Right. And a lot of folks I talked to would mention those meetings. And when I asked them if they had tried to change that, most of them were kind of like, you know, does not compute, right? <laughs> it, it wasn't something that they had, had even really considered for the most part. They just knew they didn't like it. But, you know, I did talk to one department head in student activities who was able to transition, I think, 20 evening meetings, 20 regularly occurring evening meetings, all to business hours and not in ways that disadvantage the students. And so I think as long as we reframe this as not being an example of not meeting the needs of our students or not supporting our students, but we reframe it as a, a different way of supporting our students uh, so that we can better advise and better work. I don't know about you, but I work better at 3 p.m. than I do at 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do those things. Uh, most entry level and mid managers can probably do a better job of asking clarification and saying, where does this fall on my priority list? Or when is my deadline here? I think a lot of us just sort of say, yes, I'm on it. And when our supervisors or the people assigning the task would probably be happy to help us navigate it and place it properly in terms of our other priorities. And I think that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, just thinking about the things that we're modeling and thinking about the things that we're rewarding and recognizing, uh, making sure that we're not just giving divisional recognitions to the individuals who seem to have all the time on their hands or to make time on their hands by you know, sacrificing other things they might be doing. Those are all little things that we can do that I think that with a concerted effort uh, could really make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Rosie, you, you're worth uh, graduate students all the time and you wrote this chapter on the grad school socialization. Um, I'd like you to speak a little bit to the people supervising those graduate students and structuring their practicum and their work experience and those who are oftentimes at the same time uh, supervising and managing and leading new professionals. What kind of things do you think we could suggest to those folks so they could begin to create some of the change? Lots of this is systemic and profession-wide and institutionalized, but some of it we do have some agency. How can we push into that a little bit? Part of it is really getting real with ourselves about how much work can actually be accomplished in the amount of time you have folks 
and, and that goes for grad students and full-time staff, right? If you have graduate students for 20 hours, but you have them in five to seven hours of meetings, they aren't gonna be able to redesign a whole training for the fall within a few other hours, right? So I think there is um, these questions of prioritization that then ads really hold. I think um, graduate students sometimes don't know what they should ask, right? So I, I think there is a need for us to, to really ask them what they wanna learn and what, what they might be able to learn in a particular position and sometimes they can't, right? Sometimes um, when I talk about the fear that people have about needing to know everything like right now or else they won't be competitive, um, I do think there is, uh, we can lovingly supervise folks by saying, maybe you don't need to do that right now, mm -hmm. you know, or ask them why. Like I've asked so many students, why do you want to do that opportunity? And when they can't tell me, I'm like, really, what, why do you want to do that? You have all these things, you're telling me you're stressed out. And supervisors sometimes do the same things and sometimes don't, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's because it, they are just worried they're going to fall behind or they think they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we could ask more questions. I also think we could just talk through like our own strategies and limitations. I, I think some of the power that we have as supervisors is to help make rules that are unspoken explicit, to help people understand how work is structured or not, like what you don't have control over. I think it's hard sometimes when folks who are in early career positions or mid-level positions quite literally don't have control of their time either, right? But to a grad student, they don't know that. They just know a task needs to happen and then they're asking someone else for assistance. But if we don't talk about it, it's kind of this flow of no one's really responsible. Everything is on fire. Everything has to be done right now. Um, I, and I've increasingly wondered, is everything on the same time horizon? kind of to Ben's point, we had a conversation yesterday about how the pandemic has just really warped people's sense of time and that everything's immediate. Every meeting is instantaneous. All you need to do is click a link. There's no breaks. People don't eat or use the bathroom. They just, they don't build in breaks anymore because all you gotta do is click. You don't have to walk across campus for some folks, right? And kind of reframing, how do you wanna use your time? Not that it always has to be full, um, which I'm, I will be honest, I'm still trying to learn. Like if I see a block on the calendar, I'm like, oh, what could I be doing? Um, but what would happen if we left more blank space to actually be Thanks. more purposeful? Yeah, and be more purposeful in what we want to do and figure it out, right? Like that is, I know that's like really dreamy, but these are the things that I wrestle with. And I've been kind of working with people to think more creatively about. You're having me think about um, three things, uh, and not just you, but but all of this. What's our purpose, and what's our why, and, and how does this fit? Uh, priorities are not uh, some things are life and death, and, and we got to hit that right. That's the reality. But we as student affairs professionals, we treat a lot of things that are not life and death as though they were life and death, right? right. <laughs> the the advising meeting for the event uh, six months from now, maybe we could flex that a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then also the thing that is just resonating with me is this is this both and, right? How do we navigate the systems and the individual, the supervisor, the supervisee? How do we, how do we bring all of this into the solutions? Um, what is important? How do we be student-centered, but also recognize that we have human needs as well? Um, without, I think the worrisome about both and is we just and, 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 and. But that's where we have to set priorities. Uh, well, unfortunately, we are we are running out of time, as always. Um, so I want to get one last question in from each of you rather quickly here. This podcast was called Student Affairs Now. What are you thinking, troubling, or pondering now? And I think we'll go with Ben, Rosie, and then Margaret. So Ben, what are what's really on you? And by now, I mean like lately in your career, uh, this week, maybe at the end of us recording this podcast, what's really on your mind now? We've been working so hard to adjust to the famed new normal and to rethink our work and identify new opportunities to advance our mission and serve our students, right? I've been thinking a lot about what it means for, for me and my team members and my colleagues uh, when we eventually transition back to our more traditional work. That may not be very soon and it may be a, a pretty slow slope towards that, but um, at some point students are going to 
value they do they value and they're going to expect some of those traditional activities and experiences and, and modes of operating and i've been thinking a lot about how the changes we've made in the last year or so is going to are going to impact our ability to to support those opportunities and to provide those and engage students in those ways yeah a lot of things have shifted that'll be hard to unshift so rosie how about you what's on your mind now what is it keith um <laughs> i <laughs> All the time, right? I, I think I'm always wondering what would happen if I and those I work with didn't work from a place of fear. Mm. That if I don't do something, X is going to happen. And often the X is actually not a real consequence or even a real thing. But what would happen if I slowed down? Um, because it's really hard to ask. It's, it's actually kind of terrifying for me to say, like, I should slow down and legitimately do it. Mm -hmm. consistently, not like for a day of rest, right? And those are the things that I'm thinking about. Like if, if we want to be, if I want to be in this work and in higher ed long term, what are the shifts that I need to make? And how do I want to make them with others, not just by myself, so that we can change things? Yeah, I really appreciate you coming back to that. You said that at the very beginning, and it just landed with me about how much we do out of fear. And so I really appreciate you coming back to this. Margaret, how, what's on your mind now? Yeah, I think it's getting back to what what Ben was saying too about what things are going to look like whenever whenever this all ends or whatever God willing it ends right so I think and speaking from a place of fear I think that there is fear among administrators that we need to go back to the way things were right mm -hmm. but uh, we have seen some positive changes as much as we're looking for silver linings there are yeah absolute silver linings for folks who are able to work from home and balance some uh, some other life needs. I, I do not want to pretend for one second that those who are homeschooling their children while they are working are having an easy time of it. Mm -hmm. But I think, right, I think there's an easier, I think that there are ways that we can rethink what student affairs work looks like so that we support professionals, that if somebody would thrive by working at home two days a week. Clearly we can still deliver services to our students. So I think we just need to be a lot more creative um, in how we're redesigning work. Well, and you're bringing us back to the both and. I mean, we're one of the themes of this podcast in our most recent episodes has been over and over. Um, normal wasn't that great. Why would we go back to that? Uh, I, I mean, you wrote this book. This wasn't about COVID. This was about before that. And now we're bringing in that perspective. But um, we had an enrollment cliff coming, people were burned out, uh, adjunctification, uh, cost rising, debt, uh, retention. I mean, the normal wasn't really working. So how do we give ourselves permission to, re to rethink? So thanks to all of you for your great contributions, for being great guests, for your perspectives, your ideas, and your stories of your real life. I really appreciate it. Thanks to helping all of us uh, rethink student affairs work. It's a real opportunity and, and really important. To our listeners, you can receive reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to the Student Affairs Now newsletter or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Thanks to our sponsors today, Leadershape and Stylus Publishing, which publish this book and you can get it for 30% off and free shipping using our discount code SANOW. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast, invite others to subscribe, share on social, or leave a five-star review. It really does help get conversations like this to more people and build a learning community so we can continue to make this professional development and these conversations for to you. Again, I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to the fabulous guests today and everyone who is listening and watching. Make it a great week.